invite uh, Jenna Hansen to come up, who's going to sing our national anthem. Jenna. that. All the way down the end we have our assistant superintendent Heather Cummings. We have James Pittman from Effingham. Krista Rivea from Wolfboro. Dana Streeter from Mossipi. Julianne Codnell is from New Durham. Tim Eldridge is a member at large from Effingham. We have Stacy Trites from Wolfboro. Dr. James Manning from Brookfield. Wendy Fenderson, who is our vice chair, is a member at large from New Durham. We have our chairman from Tupton Borough, Jack Widmer. We have our superintendent, Kathleen Cuddy Egbert. We have uh, Anthony Muir, who is a school district attorney today. We have Kathleen Oblinas, who is our business administrator. administrator. We have Michelle Capone, who is the uh, <coughs> business administrator, uh, sorry, school district clerk. Linda Murphy, <laughs> trying to get you a promotion there. <laughs> Linda Murphy, who's our secretary, and I don't know if our student representative is here, but uh, Connor Tomasi, are you here? If you want to raise your hand. And then Kelly Tivan, who's our Middleton rep, is right here. So before we delve into any substantive uh, issues, I'd like to dispense with some preliminary matters. First, there may be a few people in the audience who are not registered voters, and although we I'm happy to have you observe democracy in action. I would like to remind you that you may not vote on any matter today. And if you should do so, it does constitute a criminal offense. Uh, just uh, out of curiosity, how many of you are not registered voters here? Would you just raise your hand? Okay, thank you. We'll keep our eyes on you. <laughs> the purpose of today's meeting is simply to explain, discuss, and debate the Warren articles uh, that appear before you. I'm not going to discuss the, the, uh, the substance today, just the form of the, uh, the articles. We'll vote on the articles on March 10th in your respective uh, town halls or schools or wherever you do vote. There are only five articles this year, and we have a very short agenda. In Article 1, we will not discuss, which involves the election of school district uh, members. There are no contested elections, so I do predict victory for all those that have signed up. The four articles that we will discuss, Articles 2 through 5, are at the back of the annual report on pages 51 and 52. The main budget, which is Article 4, is on pages 48 through 50. Anyone that desires to amend a particular article or make a substantive motion, I would request that you reduce it to writing and present it to either myself or Linda or uh, Michelle we can show that it's accurately presented to, to the voters and in order that we have a record for our files. Uh, it's always beneficial to keep it as simple and straightforward as, uh, as possible. They also don't permit amendments to amendments on the floor at the same time, so if an amendment is 
propose, we'll discuss it, vote it up or down, and then move on to the next one. We do operate on SB2, which has three procedural twists regarding amendments. The first is you can't kill or pass over an article. Number two, you cannot amend the default budget. And number three, any wording prescribed by law cannot be amended. Uh, no more an article can be amended to delete the subject matter of the article. You can amend the dollar amount up or down. You can change the intent or the impact, um, but you can't delete the subject matter. I also don't follow any particular parliamentary uh, rules, but I will follow the rules that we've traditionally followed in the past. Uh, invariably, I'll recognize the person that submitted a particular article. This year, all four articles have been submitted by the uh, school board. So I'll recognize a school board member to first address that article before we open it up uh, to, to the public. And if an article is not amended, then it will appear as is on the ballot in March. And if it is amended, the amended version will appear on the ballot in March. Now, for those of you that do speak, there's a microphone right here in the middle of the room. And appreciate if you'd come down to the microphone so we can hear your questions or comments. Uh, please state your name and the town that you're from. Uh, this should be a fairly short meeting. Again, we only have four articles to discuss uh, uh, today, again, we'll vote substantively on them in, in March. I'll read each and every article before we discuss it, particularly for those that are listening by radio or, or on the television. An article also does not need to be moved or seconded in order to discuss it. As soon as I read it, we'll jump right in. If we do vote on anything today, a simple majority is required for an article or motion to either pass or fail. And after a reasonable period of time is allowed for guiding the discussion of a particular article, I would entertain a motion to terminate debate or call the question, and then we'll move on to the next one should that pass. Invariably, um, I waver on the side of allowing people to speak rather than precipitously or prematurely cutting off debate. For those of you that have cell phones, this would be a great time to pull them out and make sure that they are off so that they uh, don't disrupt the meeting while it's going forward. We're also all aware that we can have a motion <coughs> to reconsider a prior uh, vote or article, uh, and therefore I encourage you all to stay until the end of the meeting. If you do have to go, and you want to make sure that we don't reconsider a particular article at this meeting, you can move that we not that you can move that we restrict reconsideration. Should that pass, you can leave comfort knowing that we won't uh, rediscuss that today. And finally, we will only discuss the subject matter of issues that were in the warrant. Uh, we don't discuss anything that uh, was not mentioned in the warrant that would be inappropriate or uh, unfair for those that might have come had they known you were going to bring up a particular issue. Those are the same rules we've had in the past that we're going to use today. Uh, and then it's just a final reminder, March 10th is when we're all going to vote. If you go to page 51 of your annual report, you'll see the times and places of where you vote in your respective uh, uh, towns. In Wolfboro, we vote from 8 in the morning to 7 at night. That's an 11 hour day. It's a very long day for those of us that are at the polls. Of course, we have to count ballots after that. So anything you can do to expedite the process when you do vote, make sure you bring your license and move through the lines, it's always greatly appreciated. Uh, that having been said, it's been a tradition since 1988 that the chairman of the school board deliver a state of the school report. I therefore recognize Chairman Jack Whitmer. Jack. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jack Whitmer, Chairman of the School Board. And before I start, um, I'd like to thank um, our Superintendent, Kathy Cuddy Hagbert, Assistant Superintendent Heather Cummings, uh, Business Administrator Kathy Oblenis, uh, Linda Murphy, our Secretary, uh, and all the other people in the SAU office that have taken so much time to put today's uh, events together. Uh, the PowerPoint presentation that you're going to see is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and the paperwork and the, pres and the preparation for today uh, is really goes uh, without saying they, they do such a great job. And I just wanted to thank them for their hard work. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. And thank you for taking the time to join us for this deliberative session. I want to take a, uh, take a moment, too, to uh, thank our soloist, Jenna Hansen. I know she's left, uh, but I think she did an absolutely terrific job today. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful to hear, and we really appreciate her being here this morning. 
Thank you also to uh, the Kingswood Middle School teacher, Katie Small, who helped to arrange for Jenna to be here this morning. As we traditionally do this morning, we will review the state of our schools, rationale for each article on the warrant, and the district's proposed budget for fiscal year 2021. At this time, it's my privilege to begin with the state of the schools. It is always a highlight for me on this day to be able to share some of the remarkable programs and resources we have available for our students, in great part due to the unwavering support of our taxpayers. Not only do we continue to offer uh, strong and diverse academic programs, but we also offer students a place to shine, uh, whether it be in music, theater, community service, technology, trades, clubs, or sports. I continue to be so proud of what we built as a school community and to be part of a school board that always puts the best interests of our students at the forefront. We have a truly dedicated group of educators, administrators, and support staff who work so hard to ensure that the educational experience for all, all of our students is a priority each day. I'm looking forward to capturing some of these experiences uh, for you as I continue this morning. Our high school students continue to benefit from our Im impeccably maintained state-of-the-art facilities and talented teaching staff. Each year, staff and administration looks for ways to optimize the learning environment and experience for all students in and out of the building. There is nothing more gratifying as a board than to see our students benefit in so many ways from the support that they are given from the classroom to the community. Along with the myriad of clubs and teams offered as extra or co-curriculum, as you may know, there has been a great momentum over the years for science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM instruction. There continues to be a vital and dedicated energy throughout the district around it, which is so exciting. With offerings like coding, camp invention, as well as other robotics programs, Students continue to demonstrate their aptitude and creativity in this field, from elementary to high school. From spirit day to hands-on training <clears throat> to collaboration and outreach from our staff, our high school students are thriving through their experiences at Kingswood. The high school's continued implementation of the iSchool initiative from three years ago continues to showcase students who are trained to research collaboratively, collaboratively with staff. Their task is to identify an area of technology where thinking outside the box brings solutions. All the while, the students become empowered advocates for the goal of integrating the ethical use of technology into student life at KRHS. <clears throat> From the athletic front this past year, I am also very happy to share that NHIAA will honor 19 senior scholar athletes from Kingswood. We are very proud of these athletes who will be recognized as scholars by the state of New Hampshire next month. To be recognized, the student must have a B plus average, have lettered in two sports during their senior year, and be a positive role model in their community. Other highlights from the athletic department include a new website was launched as well as other social media accounts to increase communication within the, within the community. The NHIAA Life of an Athlete program was rolled out this past year, which included two on-site trainings conducted by NHIAA personnel. The first training was held in August for Kingswood student athletes and coaches, and then the second training was a summit for schools within our region to attend. The athletic department is happy to see the increased presence of Kingswood coaches and athletes at the local youth sports, sports levels. Clinics and camps have been held in a variety of sports such as soccer, lacrosse, football, basketball, hockey, ice hockey, <coughs> Nordic skiing, tennis, baseball, softball, in order to introduce kids to sports in a fun environment. Some clinics have had a significant turnout such as the Kingswood uh, Learn to Skate, where, where 90 students were registered for a six-week clinic coached by boys and girls hockey players and coaches at Pops Boyle Arena. 
Basketball saw similar numbers with a three-week clinic that had over 50 of our students register. All clinics are marketed via flyers that go out to our GWRSD schools and Middleton Elementary School. I am pleased to report that 16 members of the class of 2019 moved on to compete at the state level in their respective sports. I also would like to highlight some, rec some recognition received by our student athletes <coughs> over the past year. 17 of our 29 varsity teams earned a spot in postseason play during the last school year. Allison Bean earned the Ski Master State Championship, while Caitlin Carpenter was Division II Champion and Meet of Champions State Champion in the Triple Jump. Several of our student athletes were also selected to all state teams, and many also participated in community service projects such as the youth clinics I mentioned earlier. Most recently, our bass fishing team are in second place in the state, and both girls and boys cross country teams made it to the state championship. Our boys golf team competed in the state two division uh, state championship as well. Our athletes continue to represent Kingswood with sportsmanship that makes us all very proud. It is always a pleasure to share news about the vitality of our arts programs, which so many of us have had the good fortune to experience firsthand. This year in particular brings some truly outstanding accolades for our students. As some of you know, Kingswood Theatre swept all major awards and were once again named Best Production at the annual New Hampshire Educational Theatre Guild's State Festival this past April for their production of The Curious Incident of the nighttime. As you may know, if you were there, at the end of the production, the cast and crew were met with standing ovations. The award ceremony that followed ended up being largely a celebration of Kingwood Theatre's production of The Curious Incident. First, Kaylee Elkhorn and Jordy Morton were named the co-recipients for the Sarah P. Bunkley Award for their lighting, sound, and video design. Following that, Lizzie Fogg, who played the lead role of Christopher, was awarded the Robert A. Stewart Award. The evening was capped off with the curious incident being named not only the best production at the state festival for the second year, but a qualifier for the New England Drama Festival held in Rhode Island. We are so proud of their accomplishments, talent, and hard work. The theater program had a fantastic run also of the musical Disaster I recently presented Don't Let a Shakespearean Tragedy Happen to You just this past week. <laughs> On the music front, after six years of fundraising, fundraising, the Kingswood Regional High School Band has purchased 100 brand new marching uniforms. After 30 years, uh, this brings a very exciting new chapter for the band program. I want to congratulate our band students on their collaborative efforts uh, in, collect in collections and their diligence for fundraising uh, and for taking such pride in their program. We also had 15 students who participated in the All New England Chorus Festival, along with 10 students who were accepted into the All New England Band Festival at Plymouth State University. Meanwhile, 22 students participated in the Lakes Region Music Festival just recently, including today's soloist Jenna Hansen, who is accepted into the New Hampshire Music Educator Association All-State Festival. Out of all of the clarinet uh, students across the state who auditioned, Jenna scored third highest uh, score in the state. She's not only a difficult, uh, talented singer, but she's a very talented clarinetist as well. Mr. Burns, our band teacher, also shared uh, that just a couple of weeks ago, the Kingswood Jazz Band had the pleasure of hosting three college jazz professors at the Kingswood Art Com uh, Center. Thanks to the Wolfboro Friends of Music, these visiting professors worked with the band on improving their sound and skills in an inspiring afternoon of hard work and swinging music. In a continued celebration of the arts, teacher Tressa Livinoy shared with us that this year three of our high school art students, Hope Drenning, 
Charlotte Hardy, and Leon Sam submitted a total of seven drawings and paintings to the Scholastic Art Competition. This competition is a highly competitive program that recognizes creative expression and artistic achievement in our schools and is the largest and longest running recognition program for young people in the United States. Over 2,000 art pieces were submitted by grades 7 through 12 art students from throughout the state. 182 of these artworks were given gold key recognition and will represent our state at the national competition. I am very proud to share that all three of our students received awards on all of the work they submitted. All of Hope Dredding's artworks received gold key recognition. She, she also won the Dorothy Messenger Scholarship for her comic inventing horror honor. Leanne Sam received one gold key award, one silver key award, and an honorable mention for her three pieces. And Charlotte Hardy received a silver, silver key award for her painting. Their work will be on display at Pinkerton Academy in Derry until February 26th. Kingswood faculty and administration continues to be very proud of the kindness, empathy, and generosity shown by our students throughout the year with many community service projects to meet the needs of those not just locally but across the country. In the spirit of giving, Kingswood Tackles Hunger again held a food drive in late September, collecting non-perishable food items and cash donations for the Life Ministry Food Pantry. This has become an annual tradition of caring and sharing that supports those in need across our communities. Similarly, uh, Nights Against Hunger continues to grow. This is a student-run club whose mission is to help alleviate childhood hunger by providing weekend meals and snacks to Kingswood Regional Middle Schools and High School students as in need. This is done in cooperation with guidance counselors to maintain confidentiality for the receiving students. <coughs> this past year, student, uh, student council students once again ran the annual Thanksgiving basket food drive, collecting items and delivering over 50 Thanksgiving baskets including turkeys and all of the fixings to local families. It was another great year for the Wish Upon a Star Project, which distributes Christmas gifts to those who are experiencing financial difficulty during the holidays. Student Council displayed stars for students to take, granting over 150 wishes this year. This is really just a remarkable effort. Student council members also organized Kingswood's, an Kingswood's annual campaign to raise money for the Leukemia and Ly Lymphoma Society through Pennies for Patients. Beyond their charity work, the student council also organizes statewide elections, coordinates homecoming and winter carnival weeks, and, use, and uses its treasury to support an annual scholarship that ranges anywhere from $1,000 to $10,000. This year, Mrs. DeCarmo's Global Citizenship Class hosted an event to bring awareness of and to provide assistance to Syrian refugees by showing the documentary <clears throat> Kitabaya, uh, which is an independently run refugee camp in Lebanon. The proceedings from the night of food, uh, of film, food and discussion involving students and parents went to Help Syrian Kids Group. Student Council matched the money they raised from their donations. National Honor Society was engaged in community service, a hallmark of their organization. Notably, they visited the Wolfboro Area Children's Center during the holidays, as well as visiting the Mountain View Nursing Home and Sugar Hill for lunch, bingo, and Christmas carols. On most Saturday mornings at the high school, from November through March, National Honor Society students run Kingswood and Kids, which is a mentor mentorship program where members team up with Crescent Lake students in grades four through six to play games and compete, uh, complete craft projects. It is a wonderful bridge for some of our elementary students and high school students. This spring, 
Uh, the National Honor Society members will continue their service or by helping Meals on Wheels, as well as visiting each elementary school during the spring reading program. Another wonderful program, which was uh, developed by teachers Ms. Straz and uh, Ms. Kelleher, uh, yes, Kelleher. Uh, three years ago is the ninth grade mentorship program. This pairs ninth grade students with upperclassmen. They meet together every other week with the ninth graders and facilitate games and activities to, sports, to support students in their first year of high school. They cover topics from finals to schedule changes to challenges to gratitude. Ms. Strass shared that the most fascinating part of this program is that five of the current mentors were beneficiaries of the program as freshmen and just wanted to give back to the program. There are just a few, these are just a few examples of the community service that our students devote so much time and energy to that has really become a part of the culture of Kingswood. These projects, along with so many others that happen each year, demonstrate the strong commitment our students have to service to and beyond their communities. The Lakes Region Technology Center continues to be a tremendous asset for our students and for those in the surrounding districts of Maltonboro, Prospect Mountain, and Farmington. We are small in comparison to other centers across the state, but we offer one of the highest number of programs. The fact that our overall enrollment is the highest in our history, as well as the increase in students from other sending towns, speaks to the integrity of and opportunities within our programs. We are especially proud of the fact that more and more students at LRTC are earning dual credit to Laconia Community College. <clears throat> the, the option of attending college while in high school, referred to as a two plus two plus two model, sets our students up for great success as they move toward post-secondary schools. We are thrilled LRTC offers nine Running Star programs under this initiative. This is a great advantage for so many. I know I speak for the board when I say how proud we are of the accomplishments of our students at the Tech Center and of the high quality teaching and learning in each of our programs. With the work-based learning option, Qualified students who, are complete, who have completed two years in a CTE program <clears throat> can continue their education by enrolling, uh, enrolling in the community college courses I mentioned, or through formal apprenticeships and internships or customized work experiences. This builds a strong foundation for transitions into the next step beyond graduation. As of right now, we have 15 students from the center who are enrolled in this school to career program. Our construction trade program has expanded to full time, allowing for expansion into the residential plumbing, electric, and carpentry fields. This growth is much needed in response to the fields, fields shortages in these trades. And if any of you have ever tried to call a plumber or an electrician to get some work done, we're pretty impossible. So this is a great program for us. Each of our programs, as you likely know, has an active student organization which provides students with the opportunity to demonstrate leadership skills and to compete in areas uh, testing their technical skills and job readiness. 29 of our LRTC students scored at the top of their state events this year and qualified to compete nationally. One such example I thought to highlight is from the Advanced Manufacturing Program Student Jada Dusset designed, created, and fabricated a welding sculpture as part of the curriculum and incorporating academics, artistics, and technical skills. She took first place in the state competition and went on to be a finalist in the national, uh, at the national level. She has since donated her, scul her sculpture to the center, which I know Mr. Farr is very grateful for and the board is very proud to see. I know that LRTC is very grateful to our community partners who mentor our students and provide them with great experiences and in internships as this is so critical to their learning. The real world application of skills, knowledge, and work habits is palatable throughout every one of the programs offered at LRTC and this is something quite inspiring. 
Kingswood, Kingswood Regional Middle School is the place where students from all of our communities come to learn together for the first time, including Middleton students who have been with us now for five years. These two impactful years uh, before high school are intended to not only offer rigorous academics to support their growth during these adolescent years, but to strengthen work habits such as collaboration, grit, and resilience. Through team building, advisory activities, enriching field trips, and strong core and exploratory curricula, our students benefit from a great variety of opportunities to thrive during their middle school years. As a bridge from elementary to high school, middle school, middle school plays a crucial role in the lives of adolescents. A continuous focus on teaching and learning at the middle level, including social emotional learning, will continue to support a wealth of opportunities for our seventh and eighth grade students. A few highlights from, from Kingswood Middle School are reflected here in the photos you see. From hands-on inquiry-based science lessons, to rocket building in technology education, to collaboration, problem solving, and math class, students are encouraged in their learning in, in innovative ways. Field trips, such as the Freiburg Fair to study colonial times, or VISTA's weekly hike, hikes provide opportunities for learning outside the classroom, the walls. The teams work to ensure that advisors uh, advisories are a safe and structured place for students to engage with their peers and with the adults as they navigate their middle school years. Activities and celebrations help reinforce the importance of relationship building and high expectations for learning. Much like a high school, uh, service to the community is an important part of the culture here. As, as student council, uh, council students provide Thanksgiving baskets for local families, among other service projects. Our students are fortunate to be part of a tremendous music program where their choral and band talents can be showcased in a variety of ways. Whether it is their holiday concert, the annual rock concert, led by Mrs. Ms. Small and Ms. Daly Gibson, that makes you want to get up from your seats, or events like the jazz band, joining forces with Ms. Souza and the FCCLA to visit the Mountain View Nursing Home, our students are shining in every way. I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention that the theater program is thriving at our middle school for our middle school students also. You can find the Kingswood Middle School performing um, Homework Eats Dog on February 14th and 15th at the Art Center. The success of our students at the middle school and high school is built upon a strong foundation across all of our elementary schools, in addition to our sister school, Middleton Elementary School. As you know, Governor Wentworth provides SAU services to the Middleton School District, and this has proven to be a very beneficial partnership in many, in many ways. Governor Wentworth and Middleton faculty and administration work closely together to ensure commonality across our elementary schools. This allows students a high quality education in preparation for joining together as one education community in the middle and high schools. Beyond the well-aligned curriculum, our elementary schools provide many experiences, both academic and co-curricular, that I know the students benefit from. I speak for the entire Governor Wentworth Board when I tell you that one of our favorite things as, <coughs> as members is to have the students share what they are learning with us at our board meetings. I'm happy to share a few highlights from our elementary schools. For as you know, Carpenter's, uh, Carpenter students have been take, uh, taken part in some really great community and learning activities through this past year. <clears throat> some of these, just to name a few, include the open house, which is always a great chance for parents, grandparents, and other family members to experience in the welcoming community in our K-3 school. The Great Kindness Challenge is held late in January and is a week full of kindness challenges for the students to participate in. This is one for obvious reasons that I know staff and students really love to be a part of. 
Carpenter School students find themselves immersed in such things as performing at the OK Corral during holidays, parachuting, and learning to work, to work together at, at, at recess, building uh, number towers to enforce math instruction, or demonstrating two-note steady beat patterns in kindergarten while first graders build words as part of the liter literacy curriculum. STEM, brings, uh, STEM learning brings early, begins early across the district, as demonstrated in the third grade as students begin designs, build, and test pumpkins. Owl pellet dissection is a part of the hands-on science curriculum that students study very intently. The annual tradition of students serving one another Thanksgiving dinner and collecting items for the food pantry in December are not to be forgotten. As you can see, the commitment to community service begins very early for the students of our district. At Crescent Lake Elementary School, uh, grades four, five, and six continues to be engaged in, a great, in great things. Fall festival held in October allows for multi-age groups to, be, to focus on teamwork to participate in a variety of collaborative challenges. During the month of November, CLS students collected over 1,700 items for the local food bank through the Student Council-sponsored food drive, while later that, the next month, members of the Crescent Lakes Student Council and the Ukulele Club worked together to bring holiday cheer to the residents of Mountain View Nursing Home with homemade cards, performing, and singing carols. December also welcomed Crescent Lake PTO's first event, which was a holiday craft night. Students were able to work with CLS staff members and create homemade crafts for members of their family before decorating and enjoying cookies that were donated for the event. Before the holiday break, the winter concert was held here at the Kingswood Art Center, where sixth grader Megan Mansfield accompanied a choral piece with a flute and solo. The winter also brings an opportunity for participating in winter activities such as skiing, snowboarding, ice skating, and snowshoeing for CLS students. Additionally, CLS sixth grade students hosted local Tuftenboro inventor Corky Newcomb, who shared the process of invention in preparation for the launch of the sixth grade invention convention project assignment. Among other guests were members of the National Guard. Crescent Lake was proud to host detachment one of the 160th engineering company of the National Guard. CLS students learned about their role in serving our country and to share appreciation for the soldiers service. Lastly, I'm proud to share that the robotics team, the CLS Robotters, won the project award at their regional Lego League competition for their plans for an adaptive exercise trail at the NIC. The robotters, robotters uh, moved on to compete at the state level this year and rep represented CLS well. This is just fantastic. There were many, many fun highlights from Effingham Elementary School this past year. A welcome visit from members of the high school's National Honor Society was a great opportunity for the students at Effingham. Thanksgiving theater is always a great time where every member of the school community helps out to share a meal and give thanks for the caring community of Effingham Elementary School. Hosting math, light, math night is an event that allows for an opportunity for students to share teaching and learning with their families and is also a great way to showcase what the students are engaged in. Other great learning activities uh, or opportunities include visits from the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department and the Owl Pellet Program. The focus of inquiry-based science has made an impact on collaboration and learning for so many of our students across the district. The student, to see the students grow from the first day of school to winter activities, to summer goodbyes, seems to go by in a blink. But I think it may be due to the fact that so many wonderful things are happening for our students. As learning doesn't end when the school year comes to a close, 
out of our elementary schools. Camp Invention was held for the fourth summer this past year at Effingham, along with Ossipi, and it was in Wolfboro in New Durham, and continues to provide students with a fantastic program grounded in STEM principles. As I mentioned, Camp Invention is being embraced in New Durham, and they, they will be heading into their fourth summer this year. In addition to a commitment to STEM-centered learning, New Dorm embraces the arts and makes it an annual priority. The art artists in residence last spring were Ball in the House, a Boston-based a cappella group. They taught and sang with all classes, and they did a breakout session with fourth graders. At the end of the week, fourth graders performed on stage with that group. The annual holiday concert showcased New Durham students' musical talents, along with skill, the special art skills and creativity nurtured by art teacher, uh, Mr. Stasier, <clears throat> when special, uh, special headpieces were created for each of the third, grade, third graders for the presentation of the Nathbird, the, the Nawaz North Pole neighbors. Sorry about that. Fifth graders at New Durham helped to raise funds for their annual ecology school trip by presenting business plans in the form of a Shark Tank proposal, then producing products to sell within the school community. I hear that duct tape, reusable shopping bags, and slime were popular items. There is a variety of, oh, excuse me. As a, as a board, we are privileged uh, we are privileged of learning from students about the importance of the focus on social and emotional growth and how tools and strategies they are learning help to support them. The self-advocacy skills they are employing are impressive. There is a variety of after-school activities for students, such as the Quilting Club and Earth Keepers, which is focused on our natural world and develops and presents activities. This year, they presented at their, at their first ever Earth Fest on Earth Day. New Durham is fortunate to have dedicated volunteers and guest readers who regularly enjoy coming to classrooms to share their love of reading. Across the district, we are so grateful for our community members who give so much of their own time to support our students. There is also a lot of energy to be found at Ossipi Central School where there is a long time culture of community involvement. From early in the morning until the doors close in the early evening for the school's out after school program, Ossipi Central School hosts so much for our students to support the whole child. From sports to clubs to family events, you will find it all here on any given day. Ossipi highlights over the past year include a visit from Pongo of the New Hampshire Fisher, Fisher Cats to kick off their annual reading challenge. Fire Safety Week, where the first graders visited the Ossipi Fire Department, and fifth graders visiting the Swift River in Tamworth to conduct water testing as part of their science investigations. Another field trip that fourth graders look forward to is a visit to the State House, where they tour and learn about New Hampshire State Government. An exciting undertaking has been Ossipi Central students growing some of their own vegetables. While doing this, they are able to learn by making observations on the, of the growing plants. <clears throat> and then they are able to share a variety of leafy greens with the school community. Where the kindergartners are learning number sense of different manipulatives, or phys physical education classes offer activities to excite students about wellness and physical fitness. OSPE Central, Central School staff looks for ways to engage students in learning and finding ways to make it fun. The OCS motto of be responsible, be safe, and be respectful is reflected in the actions of staff and students and contributes to the positive culture of the building. I believe you can find it in the minute, the, find it the minute you walk through the doors, and this is a wonderful thing. Tuftonboro Central School, Tuftonboro students continue to practice being mindful and working together 
uh, to learn about the zones of regulation to help themselves academically, socially, and emotionally. TCS ho hosts Mindfulness Camp after school in the room dubbed the Curiosity Lab, which you will see pictured at the top of this slide. Well, the Tufton Borough Central School students are demonstrating new learning like fourth graders working on a tiny house project using area and perimeter, the TCS hiking club reaching the top of Mount Major, kindergarten students performing at the all-school Thanksgiving dinner, or fifth graders demonstrating their communication skills during open mic Fridays at lunch. The TCS community supporter, supports one another and respects the many pathways of learning. Tufton Borough continues with a third year of a robotics team who competes at the state level, who competed at the state level this year, along with the Crescent League students. Tufton Borough staff members not only do all they can to create a great learning environment for students, but they are also known to lead to in the fun, such as dressing up in at Halloween or finding unique ways of making day-to-day -day learning something the students can look forward to. Math continues to move forward with increasing buy-in from teachers. Our, ma our math instructional approach is based on engaging students in hands-on problem solving around math concepts. Students collaborate with each other and their teacher to dig into math and to develop a solid understanding of how and why math works. We had several grade levels demonstrate increased proficiency on last, spree last spring's state test and we have implemented common mid and end of mod module assessments at each grade level, K to 8, to ensure that students are being assessed at the true level of, their stand of the standards. Our district math coach continues to work with our teachers in various capacities. Our middle school math teachers are in the middle of another year of in-class math coaching and professional development time to better understand the math standards and, more importantly, how best to address them with their students. Our kindergarten and grade one teachers each have four days of math training this year. They come together with our math coach to dig into the math concepts at their grade level, to plan and observe model lessons, and to work through challenges uh, that they are seeing in the classroom. Finally, we have 30 teachers in grade K-8 who are participating in the Lakes Region Math Cohort. The feedback has been extremely positive and the word of mouth has encouraged more teachers to join in this training. In English language arts, our teachers continue to use literacy as a springboard for integration into our school subject areas. At the high school, for example, all science teachers are reading a nonfiction book related to the field of science they are studying such as astrophysics for people in a hurry in our astronomy class. At the elementary level, we are providing resources and professional development to grade three teachers around guided reading. We hope to roll out uh, to, to other grade levels in the coming year, particularly as we shift some of our attention to strengthening literacy instruction to help our students develop stronger reading, writing, and speaking skills. Finally, teachers continue to promote students' understanding in both science and social studies. The state intends to issue updated social studies standards this spring, at which point we will, re re we will revisit our K-12 curriculum to ensure alignment. We do not anticipate a major change in the social studies content, and as with any approach in math and science, we intend to continue to promote critical thinking and student engagement in our instruction and assessment. Across the district, PTOs and volunteers actively and selfishly engage with our school community to raise funds to supplement programs, chaperone, assist in classrooms, donate materials, and assist on special projects. Our PTOs and volunteers are significant partners in our work. Funds raised for our, by our PTOs have provided our schools with artists and authors in the, in the schools, 
field trips, and other great enrichment activities. Our schools are always among the select schools receiving the New Hampshire Blue Ribbon Achievement Award in honor of the high level of volunteer participation these schools enjoy. We are thankful for that participation on behalf of our students. Each year there are thousands of volunteer hours logged across our elementary schools. Thank you to all of our school volunteers. And at this time, that ends my state of the school address. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. That's uh, very comprehensive and plural. We can now move to Article 2. Article 2 says, to see if the Governor Wentworth Regional School District will vote to raise and appropriate up to the sum of $60,000 to be added to the turf field capital reserve fund previously established, and furthermore to name the school board as agent to expend. The sum to come from the June 30, 2020 fund balance available for transfer on July 1st of 2020, no amount to be raised for taxation. The school board does recommend this appropriation and in order for it to pass in March, it needs a majority vote. I understand Stacy will be addressing this. So Stacy, you're up. For several years now, we have presented a turf field capital reserve warrant article. The capital reserve was established to avoid the district getting hit with the full expense of replacing the turf field all at once. Because it's a predictable expense, setting aside a certain amount of money each year is a better way to deal with this as we can manage it over time. The life expectancy of a turf field is approximately 12 years, uh, with a cost of between $700,000 and $750,000 to replace. This reserve was established in 2013, and we currently have $457,000 in the fund. A year and a half from now, the field will be 12 years old. This past year, we had a couple of turf field experts come to look at the field to determine its condition. Because the field, the turf, has been so well cared for, we were told that with continued care and maintenance, we would likely get two, possibly three, more years beyond the usual life of a turf field. If we are able to extend the life of the field by three years, instead of replacing the field next year, our year to replace it will become 2024. And if voters continue to support this article, we will have the amount of money needed for the replacement in the capital reserve fund so that no additional funds will be raised, need to be raised at that time. Thank you, Stacy. Is there any questions, comments, discussion on Article 2? Seeing none, we'll move on to Article 3. Shall the Governor Wentworth Regional School District raise and appropriate the sum of $200,000 for repairs and improvements of buildings and grounds at the Kingswood Regional High School, Kingswood Regional Middle School, the Lakes Region Technology Center, the Kingswood Arts Center, Carpenter School, Crescent Lake School, the Effingham Elementary School, the New Durham School, the Osby Central School, the Tupton Borough Central School, and the SAU 49 slash transportation facility. The school board recommends its appropriation, and again, a majority vote will, need, will be needed for it to pass or fail in, in, uh, in March. And Julianne was going to address this. Julianne, you're up. Each year we have presented a capital improvements warrant article in order to provide a safe and healthy learning environment for our students and staff, and also to protect, protect the district's assets. For many years prior to the Kingswood project, this capital improvements warrant article was $200,000. It was reduced, reduced a few years following until it returned to $200,000 in 2015. Since then, we were able to keep the Warren article down to $150,000, due in part to the Energy Conservation Project. We knew that in the near future, we would need to again seek the original amount of $200,000 due to the age of some of our buildings. As many of you know, that time came last year. I am going to take a few minutes to highlight for you some of the great work that has been done over the past year, as well as highlight some projects that demonstrate the increase in our request. Before I move on, however, I want to say how thankful I am for how beautifully maintained our buildings are and how much I appreciate the hard work of all of our staff. Thank you. With the 200000 that you owe, our voters approved last year, we were able to complete some, some important projects, beginning with the roof at Carpenter School. 
<laughs> on the left slide, you can see the edge of the roof peeling up in great need of repair. On the right, you can see the repairs that were made. Another important repair made was the tripping hazard and limited handicap accessibility of Ossipee Central School playground walkway. This repair resulted in a much better and smoother accessibility. Additionally, at Ossipee, the gym entrance was not in compliance for handicapped accessibility. You can see the significant improvements that were made to the entrance on the right. The heating pump at Ossipee was also in need of an upgrade. The upgrade that we were able to complete results in greater efficiency and effectiveness of the pump. As you can see on the left of the slide, particularly in the photo at the bottom, the piping for the underground storage tank at Austin Beach Central School needed to be upgraded. It is important to stay on top of these upgrades, like this, so many, like this so that the materials do not leak into the soil. The significant crack in the front walkway at Crescent Lake was another improvement we were able to make with last year's funds. You can see the difference here. Future, future capital improvement projects will continue to allow us to address other necessary and significant repairs across the district. Five of our top priorities for the fiscal year 2021 include the ones you see in the following slides, beginning with the one you see here at Tuckenboro School which would be basement and interior storm window installation. As was mentioned, the roof replacement at Tuckerboro Central School over the kitchen and older entrance, which is highlighted in red on the left side of the slide. Additionally, the roof over the classrooms and kitchen area at Effingham Elementary School, also highlighted in red on the right side of the slide, is a priority. A replacement of the exterior door at Carpenter School, pictured here, is also high on our list. Finally, another of our top priorities is to install a dry valve in the greenhouse at the Lakes Region Technology Center to reduce heat consumption in the winter. The one we hope to install is similar to the one you see pictured here. We hope that you will continue to support our projects such as these, which allow us to proactively and safely address the needs in our facilities below before they become urgent issues. Comments regarding Article 3. Wild well, crowd today, I see. We'll move on to number four, Article Four. Shall the Governor Wentworth Regional School District raise and appropriate as an operating budget, not including appropriations by special warrant articles, and other appropriations voted separately, the amount set forth in the budget posted with the warrant or as amended by vote of the first session for the purposes set forth therein, totaling fifty-three million nine hundred and fifteen thousand seven hundred and seventy-eight dollars. Should this article be defeated, the default budget should be $54,286,459, which is the same amount as last year, with certain adjustments required by previous action of the Governor Wentworth Regional School District, or by law. Or the Governor, the governing body, may hold one special meeting in accordance with the provisions of RSA 40, 13, 10, and 16 to take up the issue of a revised operating budget only. Note this warrant article, operating budget, does not include appropriations requested in any other warrant article. And again, in order for this to pass on March 10th, needs a majority vote. And then, uh, Jack, you're up again. Good morning and thank you for being here again to gather information before voting on March 10th. We strive to make the budget information accessible and to be as transparent as possible for our taxpayers. In November, the Finance Committee holds three public work sessions with school and district administrators. At the December board meeting, there is a budget presentation and opportunity for discussion. At our January meeting, there is a budget hearing after which the board votes to adopt an agreed upon budget. These meetings provide voters with opportunities to become familiar with the budget. After each meeting, the budget information and PowerPoint are posted. The deliberative session is the last public meeting in which the budget is discussed before voting. We hope to answer all of your questions. However, if after today you will find you find that you have additional questions, any of us on the board or at the SAU office would welcome a phone call. Today's PowerPoint will be posted on the district website and on Wolfboro Community TV. There are many steps that go into the development, the budget development process before the budget proposal comes before the full board. Budget, budget presentation begins in October. 
Principals meet with the faculty and staff who provide them with requests, we, requests and recommendations regarding what is needed in each school. Each administrator submits a budget to the SAU office. The business administrator and superintendent of schools meet with each school leader to discuss their requests. If there is a large increase in an individual school budget, unless there is a special circumstance or very well justified rationale, the administrator is asked to review the budget and reduce it while keeping priorities intact. If any significant increase remains that doesn't have strong justification, a second cut may occur. Personnel requests are made at the same time. Requests for positions may or may not produce, be, proceed to the Finance Committee meeting depending on the strength of the rationale outlining the need for that position. The Business Administrator reviews the district line items and determines amounts to request based on past history, current expenditures, and projected pricing. After cuts, adjustments, and reallocations have been made, the Finance Committee meets with each of the principals, the Special Education Director, the Business Administrator, and the Superintendent to review the budget requests. At this time, the Finance Committee recommends changes they feel necessary to bring a, to bring a budget to the voters that supplies what our schools need and that the voters will support. These are the public meetings I referenced earlier that occur in, in November. The administrators did an excellent job bringing forward a responsible budget with few increases and several reductions, reflecting the priorities of needs in their schools rather than wants. New Hampshire, by, any, by just about any measure, is a great place to raise children. It, is the lowest number of, it has the lowest number of residents living in poverty at 7.7% in the United States. Unemployment is at 2.6%, the fifth lowest in the country. To put this into perspective, the Federal Reserve considers unemployment rate of between 5 and 5.2% full employment. The average household income is $13,045 higher than the average income in the United States. Looking at the education rankings, when including higher education, New Hampshire ranks overall number five in the nation. Pre-kindergarten through grade 12 public education ranks number three. Our students' college and career readiness is ranked at number one based on SAT and ACT scores. Based on standardized test scores, New Hampshire ranks number two in reading and number three in math. The number of children attending preschool is also quite high in comparison to other states, ranking at number 12. Wallet Hub recently conducted, conducted a study to determine which states yield the best and worst return on investment to taxpayers, analyzing each state across five key government service categories, education, health, safety, economy, and infrastructure and pollution. It is the education subcategory that is relevant to today's topic. <clears throat> there were 30 metrics used in the study, and each metric was graded on a 100-point scale. New Hampshire ranked number one on the return on investment that taxpayers receive for public education in New Hampshire. This is a summary of the broad budget categories. The budget as a whole has a decrease of 0.92%. The employee expenses have decreased by 1.59%. You, you may remember that last fall, the school board negotiated a four-year contract with the teachers, a three-year contract with support staff, and a three-year contract with administrators. All three groups agreed to pick up a portion of the health insurance premiums. This has had a significant impact on lowering the budget, and we are very pleased to bring, in, bring you a budget with a reduction. Our enrollment continues to have a slight overall upward trend. In school year 2017-2018, our population was 2,395. In 2018-2019, it was 2,426, and this year it is 2,441. 
The increase at the high school is substantial at 64 students. The total district increase over last year is 15 students. The population at the elementary level has decreased and we, and we may start to see an overall dip in the next few years. However, it is very difficult to predict. Uh, we find, to predict. We find our elementary numbers at each grade level are quite variable from year to year and the trend could quickly rebound. As I mentioned, the overall decrease in general, in general employee expenses can be attributed to teachers, administrators, and support staff picking up a portion of their insurance premium costs. Workers' compensation is also down. Tuition for professional development was reduced based on what was spent in prior years and was negotiated as part of the collective bargaining agreement. For the first time I can remember, there is a decrease in the New Hampshire retirement system. Although the school board doesn't have control over the retirement system costs, I am pleased to see this reduction. But I still want to mention that this could be reduced a great deal more if, this, if the state lived up to its responsibility. I want to remind you that since the state began to shirk its responsibility for its portion of the retirement in 2012, uh, as of this upcoming fiscal year, it will have cost the district $6,045,511. This certainly has had an impact on your taxes. Not all of the personnel requests made it into the budget proposal. Three positions, however, are being brought forward. The first is an art teaching position at the high school. This position has been requested for four years running. The art department has continued to grow. There are students who are waiting to take art classes, but cannot because there is not enough options in the schedule. There are also students ready to take a third level of art, but there is no class for them to take. A student support center position at the middle school is included in this proposal. Students come to our schools with a lot going on in their lives and this sometimes impacts their ability to control their behavior. Rather than leaving poor behavior inadequately addressed or suspending students from school, the school would like to have someone available to work with these students to help them control their behavior so they can be successful in school. And technology has expanded to every part of our school district operations. From our electronic security systems, and our nearly 200 surveillance cameras, 23 servers, firewalls, and the list goes on and on without even mentioning the number of computers, laptops, smart boards, and document cameras throughout the school for our staff, students and staff. A technology assistant is a much needed position to keep everything up and running throughout the district. Also included in the budget is a 20% increase in the Diagnostic Prescriptive Teaching position at Ossipee Central School, and a 10% increase in the di Diagnostic Teaching position at Crescent Lake School, both due, in, due to an increase in the number of special education students and the severity and complexity of their needs. As we continue with the general fund, there are several decreases throughout. Those that are most significant are the IT and transportation departments. As the IT department continues to upgrade some of the technical infrastructure, laying dark fiber, for example, we are beginning to see the fruits of our labor in a reduction in the costs of some of our technical services. There is a significant decrease in transportation contracted services because the district is anticipating the purchase of a special education van through grant funds that will allow us to do more for more of our special education transportation rather than contracting it out, which would be less expensive for us. There are a few areas of notable increases. The increase in health services this year is due to an increase in our contract with Huggins Hospital for our school nurses. Even with the increase, it is still more cost effective to work through Huggins for our nurses. The rate for athletic officials has increased, accounting for the increase in that area. And the cost of snow removal is up 
as part of a three-year contract. The repair projections based on the condition of our buses and vans account for much of the increase in the repairs and maintenance line item. Repairs and maintenance of our buses have already cost us $66,000 this year. The increase in the tuition line reflects students who are currently in out-of-place uh, district placements or those specific students who it appears may be placed out of district by the courts uh, or the school district. In the second part of the general budget, there are reductions throughout. The largest production is new equipment. Last year, at this time, technology purchases were made a priority in the budget. As a result, there are fewer needs, resulting in a reduction. Testing supplies are up since the state no longer picks up the cost of the data warehouse for test results. The cost of the materials and licenses has increased and the district would like to purchase a program tying the grade reporting system more closely to curriculum. The computer media software increase is the actual price increase in items that are needed in the transportation department, including the GPS system on the buses and the TransFinder, the program used to build our bus routes, as well as the software licenses that are required annually. And finally, this year's replacement of furniture is a priority. We have tables, desks, and chairs that have been in a couple of our schools for at least 25 years. They are in ill repair and need to be replaced. In the past few years, we have retired our debt for Ossipi, Effingham, and New Durham bonds. As our principal on the bond for the Kingswood Complex decreases, the building aid decreases, gaining 0.14% to our debt service. The revenue budget is up for next year, which is great news as the increase will help offset taxes. This past year, the legislature reversed its decision to reduce stabilization aid by 4% and increase other state aid for fiscal year 2020 only. Next year, the stabilization will not be reduced, and we expect to see a small increase in the state grant. Each year, we will see, we will see a reduction in the school building aid as the principal on the bond is reduced. Medicaid, transportation, and miscellaneous all have small increases projected. The total projected increase in revenue is 0.27%. The operational budget can be categorized in the following ways. Employee expenses, required by law or circumstance, debt, variable expenses, and pay now or pay later expenses. The required by law or circumstance categories include items such as insurance, electricity, heating oil, transportation, special education services. Pay now or pay later expenses include repair and maintenance, building services agreements, and replacement of vehicles. These items, if ignored, will cost taxpayers more if, if they are, if more than if the spending is done on a timely basis. We have paid off quite a few bonds in recent years, and the debt remaining is on the Kingswood Complex only. The variable category represents those expenses over which we have the greatest control. Examples of items in these categories include general supplies, books, printed materials, computer, computer media software, and equipment. These items have a direct impact on the curriculum and instruction for our students. Since we are a labor-intensive organization, it is no surprise that our employee expenses are by far our largest budget category. As mentioned earlier, the costs passed down to us by the state have an impact on this area of the budget. But on a positive note, um, all employee groups have agreed to pay a portion of their insurance premiums, which was a great help in lowering this year's budget. Now to understand how the money for each community is raised and the tax rate is set, it is important to understand how the cooperative formula works. 
the amount of the gross budget is $54,174,578, less the estimated revenues of $7,047,592, or $47,128,187 to be raised through taxation, is proportionally distributed to each town according to the formula. Of that total, 75% is based on the town's relative portion of the average daily membership, roughly equivalent to the number of students in attendance for, from each town, while 25% is allocated based on each town's relative portion of the district's equalized valuation. Because all towns are required to pay state education tax, both the state, both the tax and the state adequacy aid are credits used to offset the town's share of its allocation. Thus, the $47,128,187 is paid as follows. $4,384,657 in state adequacy aid. $9,454,024 paid as the state education tax. And $33,289,000 $343 as the local tax. Fortunately for the towns with less property wealth, the cooperative formula provides some relief. With 25% of the formula being based on the equalized value of the town, value the towns with less property wealth pay less per student. The town paying the least per student is Effingham at $13,428. And Tuftenboro, the town with the highest property values, pays $24,481 per student. This slide is, a, is an important one to voters since it shows the projected impact of the budget on the tax rate in each town. These are the tax rates you can expect to see as a result of this budget. Brookfield's increase is 86 cents. Effingham's increase is 7 cents. New Durham's increase is 3 cents. Ossipi's increase is 35 cents. Tuftenboro has a projected decrease of 28 cents, and Wolfboro a decrease of 8 cents. And again, <coughs> the property values have increased. However, student population changes, which has uh, an effect on those uh, tax numbers. To put the tax rate into perspective, it is useful to compare our taxes to those, to those of other communities. In order to consider this, we must look at full value tax rates that reflect properties at 100% of their value. The New Hampshire Department of Revenue Administration prepares such a report titled the Tax Rate Comparison. It lists all New Hampshire towns, cities, and land grants, identifying their respective full value tax rate for both local governments and schools. Because equalized tax rates cannot be calculated until the tax year is over, the data available runs one year in arrears. The information you see is taken from the most recent tax comparison available for tax year 2019. The chart provides a visual image for you of where we stand. 205 New Hampshire communities have been ranked according to the tax rate for school, town, and county, and placed in quadrants from the highest tax rate to the lowest, so you can easily spot where each of them, the three rank. Rather than comparing school districts, towns, and counties to each other, this compares those entities uh, charged with providing the same functions to the taxpayers, comparing school district to school district, town with town, and counties with counties. With regard to the school tax, four of the Governor Wentworth communities fall into the lowest quadrant. That's Brookfield, Ossipi, Wolfboro, and Tuftenberg. New Durham is in the lower half, and Effingham is in the quadrant three. Of the default budget. RSA 40 semicolon 13 is the official ballot law, also known as SP2. It is this RSA that determines what is to be included as part of the default budget. 
a default budget contains the appropriations in an operating budget authorized for the previous year, reduced and or increased by obligations mandated by law or previously incurred, such as debt service or contracts, previously approved in the specific amount. One-time expenditures are not included in a default budget. The purpose of presenting a default budget is to give the voters an understanding of what the budget would look like should the proposed operating budget be voted down. The budget is $53,915,778, and the default budget is $54,286,459. The default budget is $370,681 higher than the proposed budget we are asking for. It is always interesting to look how we spend our total budget as compared to other New Hampshire school districts. The chart you see here is the most recent available information showing the state average allocation for 2019 and the proposed allocation, allocation of, the New Hampshire, of the Governor Wentworth for 2021. As you can see, the majority of our expenses are allocated to regular education instruction and special education. This is expected as instruction is a priority. We believe excellent management of our special education program and our ability to service, serve our students in the community accounts for this area being 2.2% lower than the state average. Our vocational program at the Lakes Region Technology Center is a percentage point above the state average. In considering this, this it is important to remember only a handful of districts have a vocational program. Additionally, LRTC is fortunate to offer more programs to our students than other career and technical education centers. Our instructional support line includes media and testing, and the lower value is indicative of use of online resources and less of a focus on standardized testing than some of the districts. In Governor Wentworth, uh, school district spends 2.6% less than the state average on general administration and business services at the SAU level. And that ends the presentation on the budget. Thank you, Jack. Any questions or comments regarding Article 4 of the budget? Mr. Bickford. Thank you for the reduction that we're seeing. You, that's a, a great answer to this budget is a great answer to what you've heard a number of people come forward and, and complain about, actually. So this is really nice to see. Um, I was wondering, Jack, if you could uh, tell me more about, uh, I'm looking at the green page, um, and it was, and I may have missed something, it's line 240, it's tuition. And of course, there's line 561, which is tuition again, but I think it's a different animal, and I just didn't pick up all you said on that. And if it's, I, I get a feeling the first one is probably uh, students that pay tuition here instead of, but I'm, not, I'm just not sure. Is, okay. If there's, Dave, I can answer that. Um, that is, we, uh, Jack talked about that when he talked about professional development. That tuition is tuition for staff to take classes. And that was renegotiated when we negotiated the last collective bargaining agreement. That's 241? Uh, that's 240. 240. Yes, 240, I'm sorry. Yeah. And 561 then? Okay. 561 would be the special education line that we talked about. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any yeah, other questions or comments regarding the budget? Seeing none, we will move on to our last and final substantive article, Article 5. To see if the Governor Wentworth Regional School District will vote to authorize the school board to enter into a 25 year solar agreement to purchase electricity from BP Effingham LLC and further authorize the school board to lease a rectangular piece of land located southeast of the Effingham Elementary School building, measuring approximately 197 feet by 148 feet. <clears throat> to BP Effingham LLC for the purpose of installing, maintaining, and operating a solar-powered 
electric generating project on such terms and conditions as the school board shall determine are in the best interest of the school district. The school board recommends its appropriation, and again, a majority vote will be required for it to pass. Now, Julianne, you were going to address this? You're up. Thank you. Over the past year, the Building and Maintenance Committee has been researching the possibility of utilizing solar energy in our schools to reduce both our carbon footprint and energy costs. Reviewing the options for each school, Effingham Elementary School has the best situation for accommodating solar power at this time. The district has worked out a lease purchase agreement with Barrington Power, which involves the construction of solar panels on Effingham School property. The panels will generate enough electricity to power Effingham School. The solar electric system will consist of a 100 kilowatt AC solar electric system and a 129 0.6 kilowatts of solar panels. The solar panels will be mounted with a racking consisting of ram steel posts. The array will be surrounded by a six foot chain link fence with two access gates. It will be connected to the existing building electrical system through an access hole created between the existing transformer and the building. We are very excited about this project. Because it is a lease purchase agreement, there is no need to raise funds for its construction. We will not only be accessing power at a reduced rate, but will be reducing our carbon footprint as well. Jack Bingham, Barrington Power CEO, is here today to explain the project in more detail and answer any questions you may have. So at this time, I'd like to introduce um, Jack Bingham. I'm going to go through uh, three or four slides here that show the basic layout of this thing, and then I'll explain to you how the solar installation will work in conjunction with the school, and then I'm happy to take anybody's questions. So um, this is a 129 kilowatt DC solar electric system. You can see up there that there are basically five rows of panels. Uh, the racking, as you mentioned, are, are constructed of posts that are rammed into the ground, so there's no concrete, there's very little excavation. Um, the racking is two panels high. That space, as you can see, is about, is about 150 by 200. Okay, next slide. So, um, in order for these things to be safe, there either needs to be uh, meshing on the back of the panels to cover up the wiring, or they need to be surrounded by a fence that's based on the, the National Electric Code. But because this is a school um, adjacent to a playground, the fence seemed to be the logical choice. It, it, you know, the panels are low enough in the front that a child can easily run into a corner and hurt themselves. So the, so the thing is surrounded by a fence and locked. Next. So this, this piece of ground um, was a sand pit that has had extraction done in the past, so it's basically a flat, sandy soil area, and almost all the trees are either very small birch or very small pine. They're packed so tightly that they'll never turn into anything. Um, so in order to provide enough sunlight for the array, we're cutting an area of trees around the outside of this array, but again, they're mostly it's mostly scrub. There's no there's no valuable lumber here, um, and again, it's a it's a really nice flat sand pit, which is not often really in front of these. It's actually an ideal location to do something like this. Next. So then there's a there's a transformer on the outside of the building, and we're doing what's called connecting behind the meter. In other words, the power comes into that transformer. The utility whose ever source meters it, and then we connect between the building and the meter, which means that all of the power that's generated goes into the building. Okay, next. So, so here's how these things basically work. You've got a you've got a set of panels. You have what's called an inverter because these are this is DC electricity. We need to convert it to AC electricity. It's then connected to the building, and depending on what's happening within the building determines how the power is handled. During the day, almost all of this power is going to be consumed by the building. On the weekends, when there's not as much power being used, it's likely that some of the power will go out through the meter. And the utility actually installs a meter that measures in two directions. So they see power coming in, they also see power going out. The power that goes into the building is valued at retail. And just to review, uh, an electric bill essentially has four components. It has a, a customer charge, which they charge everyone just for the pleasure of having a meter. Um, there's the cost of electricity itself. And then there's the cost of transmission and the cost of delivery. When we supply solar electric power to a building that goes into the building, you essentially get credit for those 
three of those four items, you still you still pay for the pleasure of having a meter, but the solar power offsets the cost of electricity, the cost of transmission, the cost of delivery. When the power goes out through the meter, the utility actually um, whacks us 25% on transmission. So you don't get the full retail value, but you still get credit for the power that you generate. So um, the way the system is designed, it's likely that five sevenths or more of the total power will be valued at full retail. And then we're going to get a slightly discounted amount of balance. Um, solar panels in general come with a 25 year warranty. And the warranty states that the panels will still be generating 80% of their original capacity at the end of 25 years. So you can imagine that these things have a 40 or 50 year life, which is unlike just about anything else we buy for our houses, schools, or anything else. Um, inverters will likely be replaced once in that 25 year contract. All of the maintenance, operation, and performance, we are responsible for. My company uh, currently owns about two and a half megawatts of power. This represents about 14 systems in New Hampshire and Vermont. This is something that we do on a regular basis. And one of the reasons for doing this is that when you install a solar electric system, there's a 30% there's a tax credit that's, that's granted to, to the buyer. Now, because the school system is a nonprofit, you can't take advantage of that 30%. So the school system could go out and buy this thing, but they would pay 30% more for it. What happens with us is, we essentially borrow the money uh, to buy the system. We find tax investors who are looking for the tax credits. We sell them the tax credits. And by doing that, we can give the district a discount on electricity because we, we've got that 30% to make the cost lower. So that, that's more or less how these things work. Um, I'm happy to take any questions from anybody about it. Are there any questions for either Mr. Bingham or Mr. Lang. Uh, Gordon Lang. I don't know a whole lot about solar collectors, but I'm, you hear things. Um, we were told a couple of years ago that the, the best solar collectors are, were made in China, that they were slightly better than the, the ones we were making here. And I'm told that we also have a, we pay a, a certain import duty on those now too. And I didn't know where yours came from, and maybe you can comment on those. Sure. So um, the, the question was, if you couldn't hear, where are the solar panels made? So, um, unfortunately, as a country, we actually don't make many solar panels. I wish that were not true, uh, but it's the case. Uh, solar panels come from a lot of countries. They come from mostly Asian countries. Uh, however, there are companies that are building panels in Germany. There are several Korean companies that are installing factories in like South Carolina, as car companies are doing. Um, but in general, it's likely that the panels that we buy for this project would be far and away, just because the American panels are so much more expensive and so unavailable. Um, you said something about efficiency, so we can comment on that. Um, when I started this in 2007, panel efficiency was somewhere around 12%. Um, and the panel size was, you could get a 150 watt panel for affordable price. The current panels are 18 to 20 percent efficient. The size of this panel is likely to be 390 to 400 watts, so 22 percent efficient. And that panel actually costs about 7 percent less than what it would have costed seven years ago. So the price of solar has dropped at an amazing pace. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Bickman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the numbers again. Uh, I heard that this was a lease purchase. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was called a lease purchase. So I'm looking for the benefit to the okay. uh, school district. Is there a kilowatt advantage that yep. we're going to receive? Is there actually a lease purchase that we'll be making a payment yep. on this? So how do the numbers work? Okay. So so this is actually it's actually called a power purchase agreement, not a lease purchase. Um, the way this works is. Uh, we estimate what the annual production of the system will be. In this case, we're estimating 152,424 kilowatts. That's an annual estimate. And then um, we're charging the district 9.85 cents, and the current average price is 10. So you get a slight discount on the power. And what happens is 
we charge a fixed rate per month, so so we don't we don't have to bill separate amounts every month. We bill the district a certain amount per month, and at the end of the year, there's what's called a true up. We look at what we actually produce and what the district actually paid, and somebody owes somebody money. And usually, the reason for that is weather. You know, if we look at solar production two years ago, all of our systems were probably three percent off what we expected. This year, they were actually four percent ahead. So there's a there's an annual true up. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm vaguely getting it. Okay. So, so, um, and then there's a 1.85 percent escalator per year, which which is less than the 30-year average of utility increases per year, which is two percent. At the end of six years, which is the end of the tax recapture period, the district actually has the option to buy the system. And the initial starting price at the end of six years is about 50% of the initial value. However, the contract does run for 25 years, so the school district could elect to buy the system at some point. The school district could elect, allow to let the contract run for 25 years. And at the end of 25 years, there are five-year extensions available. That's pretty much the lease. Some follow-up there, Mr. Yeah, the lease. The lease is the land, actually, from the school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you have a question, you should get to the microphone so we can all hear. All right, Lynn. Um, Madeline Ness, I have a question. Who's going to break the panels in the winter to get the most efficiency from your system? So. Um, what we do up here is we mount the panels at 35 degrees and mount them a minimum of 40 inches off the ground. And the reason is that it's really not practical to go out and break these things. It just gets, it gets, it's in our financial interest to do. We're actually, we're actually upgrading the facility we own in Paul, Vermont just because of this reason. It's like the efficiency of the panels is so much better now that it's actually financially practical to increase its value. So I would say um, it's in our financial interest to provide the school district as much power as they need over the term of the contract, whether that means using the existing equipment or, or upgrading. Mr. Bickford. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <laughs> well, I guess my main question is, uh, I know some companies put up um, decommissioning escrow accounts yep. in the event something whatever happens, an act of God happens, you know, and, and crashes everything. Um, I don't know if you're on the hook for replacing it all, whatever, but if something happened that it had to be taken apart, yep. or at the end of 25 years, whatever, who takes care of the project that's left? Right, well, so uh, two things. Um, as part of the contract, we're obviously required to maintain uh, liability and equipment insurance uh, to cover incidents like, like lightning. I've had one of those in the last two years, it was an issue. Um, there's not a bond on the removal, and the reason behind that is that the recycled value of the aluminum and steel is high enough that we don't feel that that needs to be covered. All right, are there any other questions or comments <laughs> regarding Article 5? Mr. Lamb. This is more for the school board. Um, it sounds like Effingham is the easiest place to put this into, into practice. Is there anticipation of trying to put in solar systems in other schools using rooftops and other options? That's a great question. Absolutely, we would be open to that. Effingham's just a start. We'd like to see how Effingham goes, how the transition is, how smoothly it is, but we would definitely be open to looking at other options. Any other comments or questions regarding Article 5? Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, we'll move on to new business. We do have one item under new business, and uh, we have a presentation to make. Jack? This is a, a very bittersweet, but I'd like uh, Stacy to come up. After 13 years of service, Stacy Trice has decided not to run for the school board for the next term. Stacy has served as vice chair and chair twice, as well as group leader for the academic affairs for many years. She is known for always putting students first and being able to get to the heart of the matter before the board, quickly, before the board quickly. She 
She has supported and worked hard on many projects, including the Kingswood Project and the Energy Conservation Project, which took place a few years ago. She has been an incredible asset to the work, to the work of the Academic Affairs Group, uh, which recommends policies for the overall operation of the district, and in particular, curriculum, instruction, and assessment work. Not only has she worked hard on behalf of the children and families of the district, Stacy has been a pleasure to work with over the years. She is kind, smart, and astute. The school board administrator and school community will miss Stacy very much. We hope this is just a pause in service, Stacy, and that you will be back. Please accept this as a small token of gratitude for everything. over time is that no matter what the problem we have to solve or the things we have to get through this district from the from the um, administrators to the staff to the support staff to the school board we there's this singular focus on what's best for the student so that has made doing the work um, I have done um, really a, a privilege and an honor so thank you all right, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have today. I'd entertain a motion to terminate. So moved. So okay. moved. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>